We're continuing in our Bible interpretation series. And we are now at the rule of literal interpretation, confounding the wise. Our text is in Matthew 25, verse 15 and 16. Let's read it together, church. And when the chief priest and scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, and the children crying in the temple, and saying, Hosanna to the son of David, they were sore displeased, and said unto him, Hearest thou what these say? And Jesus said unto them, Yea, have you never read, out of the mouth of babes and sucklings thou hast perfected praise? Holy God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the good singing today, Lord. We thank you for a good attitude about church today. We thank you for the pretty spring weather. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for a preserved Bible. Now, God, help me preach it right. And may you give me good ground to preach upon, Lord. Open hearts, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. The Lord had just cleansed the temple. I think he did it several times. He was then healing the blind and the lame that came to him in the temple. So this is the context here. Little children began to shout praises to the Lord. They were saying, Hosanna to the son of David. And the religious leaders were sore displeased about that. These children were basically saying that the Lord Jesus, Jesus of Nazareth, was the promised Messiah, the coming king of the Jews. That's what they were saying. From the seed of David, that he would deliver Israel from the Roman Empire the prophesied fourth kingdom. They were saying, He's here, the son of David, the king. There was a prophecy in Zechariah that said, Rejoice greatly. That's what they were doing in fulfillment of this prophecy. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout. That's what the kids were doing. O daughter of Jerusalem, behold, thy king cometh unto thee. They were saying, He is the King. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding upon an ass, upon a colt, the foal of an ass. The Lord had just fulfilled this prophecy before He cleansed the temple. He came riding into Jerusalem on an ass in fulfillment of this very prophecy. And the people, the adults at that time, and everybody began to shout, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. You can read about this in the previous verses there in Matthew. Or right here in the book of John 12, they took branches of palm trees and went forth to meet him and cried, Hosanna, blessed is the king of Israel that cometh in the name of the Lord. The king of Israel, you see that? They knew that he was a fulfillment of that Zechariah prophecy. They knew at that very moment as he rode upon that ass, he was fulfilling that prophecy. And then he cleansed the temple. And then he began to heal the lame and the blind. But then all of a sudden, children began to praise him. Children began to praise him. And when the chief priests and scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, cleansing the temple, uh, healing, and they saw the children crying in the temple and saying, Hosanna to the son of David, they were sore displeased. The word Hosanna is said to mean save now. Notice Psalms 118.25, save now, Hosanna. Save now, I beseech thee, O Lord, 
O Lord, I beseech thee, send now prosperity. And notice this, verse 26. Blessed be he that cometh in the name of the Lord. What were they saying? They were saying, Hosanna. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. They said these very words. We have blessed you out of the house of the Lord. They were praising God out of the temple, in the temple. This was a fulfillment of this prophecy in Psalms. He that comes in the name of the Lord, that's the king. The multitudes that went before and that followed cried, saying, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. There it is. Singing that psalm. Hosanna in the highest. And when the chief priests and scribes saw the wonderful things that he did and the children crying in the temple and saying, Hosanna to the Son of David, they were sore displeased. <coughs> Some wonder that since Hosanna is said to mean save now as a prayer, why did the people say Hosanna to the son of David? He doesn't need saving. It's not that he needs saving, but that he was the source of salvation or deliverance. He's the one that gives it. So when they say Hosanna to it means salvation too, meaning he is the one, he is the source, he is the Savior. Notice Revelation 7. And cried with a loud voice saying, salvation to our God. Does God need salvation? No, it's saying that salvation is coming from God. He is the source. He is the one which sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb. Salvation to the Lamb, see. The Lamb who died for your sins and is coming to cleanse the world and establish his kingdom. Now, all of this means that the chief religious leaders were angry. They were angry at the fact that these little children were proclaiming Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus of Galilee, the carpenter's son. They were proclaiming him to be the Messiah. This was a horrendous situation in their eyes. They felt it was inappropriate that the children were disrupting and that they would praise this man, especially that man, in such a fashion. They felt the Lord Jesus needed to immediately rebuke those kids, those children, for their presumption and their ignorance as well as their blasphemy because they knew what they were saying. They knew they were proclaiming him to be the Son of God, the prophesied king, which they knew was Emmanuel, God with us. How dare this mere carpenter from a country reason of Galilee that was mixed with Gentiles and Jews, a hill country area in Lower Galilee. And not only that, they had their own special dialect. Everybody knew that they were from Galilee. Peter tried to hide it. He says, I know where you come from. You're right from the Ozark. I meant the Gal uh, uh, from, from Galilee. They recognized their dialect. Him? You're proclaiming him to be the king, the Messiah? Stop them, they said to the Lord Jesus. This is very out of line. So, does our Lord make the children to be quiet? Nope. They said unto him, Hearest thou what these say? And Jesus saith unto them, Yea. Yeah. Have you never read, Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings thou hast perfected praise? The Lord says, in effect, yeah, I hear him, so what? Not only was it fitting, not only was it beautiful, but what, what they were saying was perfectly true and very pleasing to God, I might add. But here's where we get to the point of this message. We've been noticing the Lord's rebukes 
to the religious leaders. We've noticed how he says often, have you never read, or such like. And he corrects false interpretation. And he usually gives us a key of interpretation. And we've been collecting these. We've been going through our Lord's words and collecting these principles of interpretation. The lesser to greater, the greater to lesser, all of these things. I won't list them now. But the Lord gives you a key that if you use that principle with humility and diligence, you can understand the Bible. In fact, these things, if you study the Bible with humility and diligence, God will guide you to understand these principles. In other words, the Lord's saying, have you never even read this, let alone understood it? Why didn't you see this in the Old Testament? If you'd been following along, you would realize that all of this had to be fulfilled. This principle that we're going to learn about today is so foundational, it is pretty much the very cornerstone, I would say, of Bible interpretation. What is this principle? Have you never read, out of the mouth of babes and sucklings, thou hast perfected praise? The Lord replied by rebuking them for acting as if they never read the eighth psalm, which was a messianic psalm. Had they done so, and had they applied the principle of literal interpretation, which they claim to understand, by the way, they would have easily seen that the prophecies foretold that when the Lord reveals himself as king and the triumphal entry, multitudes would praise him as the Messiah, the great king and the savior. But not only adults, but children also. Children also. Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings thou hast perfected praise. The Lord's saying you never read the eighth psalm. It's a messianic psalm about me is what the Lord's saying. Oh, Lord, our Lord. How excellent is thy name in all the earth, says Psalm 8, who has set thy glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings hast thou ordained strength because of thine enemies, that thou mightest still the enemy and the avenger. Shut their mouth. The weakest of all, babes and sucklings, were able to understand and praise the Messiah, the King. But these great religious leaders, educated religious leaders, they were blind and they were missing all the prophecies. They were missing the plain understanding, what the prophecies were plainly saying. You had little babies that were still nursing, little sucklings that were still nursing but could talk in the process of being weaned perhaps. Uh, and here they were, able to talk, able to sing. And they're able to say, Hosanna. This is the king. This is the king that was to come. They're able to say that. What a shame. It ought to shut the mouth of every one of those religious leaders. They wanted the children's mouths to be stopped. Or the Lord showed, no, your mouths need to be stopped. This is the lesser to greater argument also. If babes can understand it, what's wrong with you? The Bible says the word of God, it's all plain to them that understand, unless you want to be a fool. What can be blinding these religious leaders? It must be pride and envy that's making them so foolish. I want you to notice very carefully. The Lord interpreted this prophetic psalm in an extremely literal sense. 
Whatever meaning, spiritually or figuratively, you would like to apply to out of the mouth of babes and sucklings, when the Lord interpreted it, He interpreted it as babes and sucklings. Little children. And this principle that our Lord is teaching is going to be revealed again and again. The principle has been understood down through the ages. It can be summed up like this. Here is, the, here is a biblical, the biblical way to understand the Bible. If the literal sense makes sense, seek no other sense. Or... Literal unless absurd. So when you open the Bible, interpret it literally unless it would be absurd or unbiblical to do so. Now, that's easy to say. Not always easy to be consistent with. Because we'll see in future messages that you might think something's absurd or unbiblical because your foundation is wrong somewhere else in the puzzle you're putting together see you've got a mistake an assumption somewhere and until you pick that up you're gonna be blind or you can't go any further see the Pharisees and scribes interpreted the Bible literally they weren't liberal Sadducee that's why the Lord said they sit in Moses seat it doesn't mean they weren't sinful and hypocrites He's saying, don't, don't follow the liberals. Don't follow the, that crowd. Those that interpret the Bible literally, that's the crowd. They're just hypocrite. They knew that the Lord would be born in Bethlehem. They knew that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. So why didn't they embrace Jesus? Because they said he grew up all these years in Galilee. He's not from Bethlehem. So they mocked and they laughed and they scorned and they said, there's no way. We are the scribes. When the Messiah comes, he will be from Bethlehem. Who's this Galilean? If they'd taken the time, they could have went and said, can we ask you where you were born? Maybe they could ask his brothers, his relatives, where was he born? But see, when you have, and I don't want to get too far into this, but when you have, we'll do that later, but when you have an agenda, when the cost is too high, when it hurts your pride, or it upsets your apple cart and causes you trouble, a lot of times you become very blind and you don't do the research necessary to see that something's true. This principle does not mean that there is never another secondary spiritual or devotional application. It just means that you have to leave the literal sense alone unless it would be absurd or unbiblical to interpret it that way. I'll give you a quick example. The Lord calls His disciples His sheep. He does not mean that they are genetically transformed into literal sheep in the animal kingdom. When he says, you are my sheep, he does not mean they are literally flesh and blood sheep. You say, how do you know? Because it would be absurd. It would be unbiblical. It would disagree with other scripture. It's ridiculous to say that. But you know a very strange thing? It is a very wild, bizarre thing. The Catholic Church and all the denominations that came out of her, that copy her, the daughters of the whore, the Catholic Church is chiefly known for turning literal things into figurative things. Denying the literal. Down through the ages, it's really been a, a battle between Catholic interpretation and what they call Protestant interpretation. 
Now, the Protestants have become like the Catholic Church in so many ways, they're not even protesting anything anymore. But there were always Baptist and literal interpreters down through the ages. And I want you to see the bizarre thing. The Catholic Church, which is known for figurative interpretation, when they get to the one verse that should be literal, uh, uh, that, that should be figurative, suddenly they switch gears and say, well, now that's literal. How can anything be so insane? Only the devil can do that. You go through the whole Bible, and everything that's supposed to be literal, you make figurative, and then you get to one verse that really ought to be figurative, and they say, that's literal. Wow. Luke 22, and he took bread and gave thanks and break it. Okay, that's bread. And gave unto them, saying, this is my body. Do you know how many thousands, I would say millions, have died through the centuries? Because they came to him and they said, I want you to confess that this bread has been turned by the priest into the literal body of Jesus, so much so that you need to worship it right now. They said, no, that's insane. No. No, you're, you're telling me you're sacrificing Jesus again? You're going to break the bread and sacrifice the Lord again? And so now, this is unbiblical in so many ways, and not only is it unbiblical, it's insane. It's absurd. No, I will not confess that that cookie, that bread, is the body of the Lord Jesus in a literal sense so that I would worship it. No, it's a very special, symbolic, figurative picture. And you need to take pictures in a very serious way, but it's a picture. No, I will not. You, you did not turn that into the literal body of the Lord Jesus. That's insanity. That's insanity. Thousands, millions down through the centuries died for that reason, right there. No, no, no. But the Lord showed that when the psalm said babes and sucklings, this is what it meant in the fulfillment. It was literal. And the Lord expected the Jewish leaders to make this application to himself. The psalm teaches that out of the weakest things, God ordained strength. The Bible says that uh, the joy of the Lord is your strength. The joy of the Lord is your strength. So both endings are inspired. That bubs, uh, babes and sucklings have perfected praise out of their mouths and that they have ordained strength. They're both inspired by the Holy Ghost. The question is this. When will God bring strength and perfected praise out of the mouths of babes and sucklings in relation to the king, the messianic king. Why didn't they ask that question? So the leaders were asking Jesus, stop the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. That's what they were saying. The principle of literal interpretation is whatever Spiritual, figurative, or partial fulfillments or applications may be derived from Old Testament prophecy. There is still a literal fulfillment that must not be set aside. A lot of times, even those of the literal school of interpretation, as we see here, are often guilty of inconsistency or limitation of their own principle. The Pharisees and scribes, as we said, usually stood against the Sadducees. The Sadducees denied literal interpretation. They were basically infidels and what we would call liberals today. Let me prove this to you really quick. Matthew 17. His disciples asked him, saying, Why then say the scribes that Elijah must first come? Why did the scribes say Elijah 
must first come because they were conservative scribes. They had a biblical foundation of literal interpretation. And they believed that when the Bible said Malachi that Elijah's going to come and restore all things, they believed it meant Elijah. And Jesus answered and said unto them, basically the scribes are right. Elias, Elijah truly shall first come and restore all things. Wow, the Lord confirmed the literal interpretation of the scribes. The Lord is showing that whatever partial or figurative applications may be applied, do not overthrow or negate the final, literal, plain fulfillment of whatever the Scripture says. What did the Scripture say? It said in Malachi 4, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord, and he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. There must be a division here. Something is wrong with our age right now. The heart of children are not to their fathers. And fathers are not really caring about their children. Something is wrong today. And Elijah's going to come fix it and start cursing everything. And this world's going to keep shaking and shaking. It's going to get worse and worse till the tribulation period comes. Then Elijah's going to show up. And I'm telling you, you need to get a hold of this right now. You need to get a hold of this right now and start getting your heart straight with your father. This needs, to be, this needs to happen right now. If God's going to curse it then, He'll curse it now. But my point is this. It said Elijah's coming. The scribe says, that means Elijah. That means Elijah. Jesus says, you're right. That means Elijah. John the Baptist was already dead when Jesus said this. Elias truly shall first come. John the Baptist in the spirit of Elijah, he was already dead. You said, well, wasn't he a type of Elijah? Sure. Wasn't he in the spirit of Elijah? Sure. But they asked him, are you Elijah? He said, no. Nope. I'm John the Baptist. I'm the one crying in the wilderness. Remember over there in Isaiah? I come in the spirit of Elijah. But because somebody came in the spirit, because there was a spiritual fulfillment, because there was a figurative fulfillment, because there was a partial fulfillment, that does not overthrow the literal, plain fulfillment that has to stand. Unless it would be unbiblical or absurd to do so. The Lord said, Elijah, Elias truly shall first come. I won't get into it today, but our Lord teaches another principle of interpretation called not just the literal sense, but the grammatical sense. Always stand. Remember, he makes a big argument. The Lord didn't say, I was the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but I am the God. The Lord says, look at the tense. That matters. Our Bible shows us that just the plural or singular matters. Just putting the S on the end of the word, one letter matters. Every jot and tittle matters. So that's called the grammatical law of interpretation. I tell you what, what does all this really mean for you? It means when you go back and read that Bible and you see something plain about prophecy or God's commandments, it means what it says. You have to study, show yourself, approve. you got to reason with the Scriptures with God. But you need to understand, it means what it says. Quit playing with the Bible. Quit playing games with the Bible, trying to justify sin. I have a book that I've written called The History and Defense of Literal Interpretation, where I show history of the cults and all of the false denominations, and how much trouble comes from not literal interpretation, as they want you to think, but from figurative interpretation. See, if you believe in figurative interpretation, you can make the Bible say whatever you want it to say. But literal interpretation, you can't play around with that. No, all of the bad things in history didn't come from literal interpretation. It came from figurative interpretation, these cults and crazy things. Read my book about it. If you email me, I will send you the ebook for free. 
What a mess people have made over the years by not holding to this principle. Seventh-day Adventists, Mormons, JWs, so-called Watchtower, UFO cults. I mean, just all the way down. The whole thing is a bunch of slop that comes from not interpreting the Bible literally. The Lord said the psalm plainly taught that babes and sucklings would magnify the Messiah. The Lord interpreted babes and sucklings literally. I want you to see that it was a messianic psalm. The psalm reads this way, Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings hast thou ordained strength. What is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visited him? Uh-oh now, hold on a second. For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels, and hast crowned him with glory and honor. Thou madest, to have, madest him to have dominion over the works of thy hands, and thou hast put all things under his feet. Hold on a second. At first reading, there is a historic, simple application to mankind. Mankind is lower than the angels, and he's over the animals. And in one sense, he's been crowned with glory and honor to not be a baboon. Unless you go to modern college where they say you're really a baboon. However, there is another principle of interpretation that's taught by the Lord, and it is double application, double reference. So what you have here is not only an application to mankind, but you have a prophecy of the Son of Man that will be crowned with glory and honor, who will have all things put under His feet. This is a messianic song. Our Lord expected them to know that. And in this messianic psalm, it said that babes and sucklings would be praising him. So our Lord's really saying is, what kind of scribes are you? You're supposed to hold a literal interpretation. You're supposed to understand the messianic references. You're supposed to understand double, interpreta double application. You're supposed to understand literal interpretation. Why didn't you see that these babes and sucklings praising me right now at this time is a fulfillment of prophecy? Now, the Lord Jesus was and is sinless. He was God manifest in the flesh, but he was a man, a perfect man. Thus, in his earthly body, he was made a little lower than the angels. You don't believe me? He got hungry. I don't think angels get hungry. They can eat, but they don't get hungry. The Lord got tired in his body, and he slept. Angels don't sleep. They don't need to sleep. They don't get tired. The Lord came in a human body without sin, made a little lower than the angels, just like you. But notice this double application. See, this will keep you from becoming a preterist and a post-millennial and all of these weird, wacky things that people fall into because they don't understand basic. They didn't go to the Lord and the Holy Spirit Himself right here in the Bible to learn how to interpret the Bible. See, the Holy Ghost interprets the Bible for you and shows you how to do it. Our Lord Jesus interprets the Bible for you and shows you how to do it. There's no excuse for falling into these things that people fall into. Uh, let me show you the principle of double application so you would understand Psalm 8 is both a teaching about mankind in general, being higher than the animals, but is also a messianic prophecy of the Lord Jesus Christ ruling this world at the second coming and throughout eternity. Let me show you 2 Samuel 7. Listen to it carefully, please. I know these are some deeper things today, but really it holds the key to keeping you from going off into some cult or something. You understand? That this helps you understand the Bible. And if you don't get this right, I tell you what, you're on dangerous ground. 2 Samuel 7, And when thy days be fulfilled, and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, talking to David, I will set up thy seed after thee. 
which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. And he shall build a house for my name. Who built the temple? Who knows? Solomon. Solomon was the son of who? David. So he was David's seed. God established his kingdom. He built a house for his name. And I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Uh-oh. Forever? You could say for a lifetime. It sometimes means that. But it doesn't, there's something going on here. It's like we're dealing with Solomon, but we're also got something else in mind. There's a double application going on here. Watch it now. I will be his father, and he shall be my son. If he commit iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men. Well, that can't apply to the Lord Jesus. The Lord's not going to commit iniquity. That must be applying to Solomon, the, the king at the time of David, uh, David's son. I will punish him with the stripes of the children of men, but my mercy shall not depart away from him. Okay, we have a double prophecy here. The near fulfillment was Solomon. He did commit iniquity and was chastised, but the far fulfillment was in the Lord Jesus, the son of David and the son of God. One part of it applies to the near, one part of it applies to the future. Now listen to what the Holy Ghost does. Watch this. Hebrews 1, For unto which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee, and again I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. The Holy Ghost quotes our, I will be his father, he shall be my son. The Holy Ghost said that this prophecy Paul is arguing that this prophecy is a prophecy of the Lord Jesus Christ, that he is going to build a temple, that he is going to have a kingdom that will last forever, and he is the Son of God. Wow. So, back in the Psalms, part of it applies to man in general, but... The whole thing is a picture of our Lord Jesus Christ. Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings has thou ordained strength. They're going to praise the Messiah. What is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visited him? For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels, and hast crowned him with glory and honor. Thou hast made him to have dominion over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things under his feet. Let me show you now. Let me show you. Paul says, 1 Corinthians for he must reign, the Lord Jesus, till he hath put all enemies under his feet. Paul's saying in fulfillment of Psalm 8. That's a fulfillment of the Lord Jesus. A fulfill now you get to reign with the Lord Jesus too. You get to reign with the Lord Jesus. Just as you're reigning over animals now, or should be, there's going to be a time when you get to reign over the whole world through the King, the Messiah. All things under his feet applies to the Lord Jesus, says Paul. It applies to the Lord Jesus. Look at Ephesians 1. Which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. Wow, he's been crowned, hasn't he? And hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head. Paul is applying Psalm 8 to our Lord Jesus Christ, a messianic psalm. Hebrews 2. For unto the angels hath he not put in subjection the world to come, whereof we speak. That's the millennial kingdom. But what in a certain place, that's Psalm 8, what in a certain place, that's Psalm 8, testified, saying, What is man that thou art mindful of him, or the son of man that thou visiteth him? Thou madest him a little lower than the angels. Thou crownest him with glory and honor. Thou didst set him over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet. For in that he put all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. But now we see not yet all things put under him. That is, the devil's still running loose and there's some things going on. Oh, it's under God's legal authority. But there's going to come a time when the Lord's going to rule this earth as he currently does heaven right now. And everything will be established under his feet. And then, of course, in eternity when the final rebellion of the wicked is over, it will be the final, ultimate fulfillment of that prophecy that all things will be under God's feet. 
All right. We have therefore a prophecy. The king of the Jews, the Christ, will come and reign. The scribes should have known the double nature of prophecy. They should have known that in general the Psalms point to Christ. Notice what the Lord says. Uh, uh, Paul goes on to say, but we see Jesus. In other words, he's applying it to Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, that he by the grace of, of God crowned with glory and honor, that he should taste death for every man. I got a little scrambled, but the point is it applies to the Lord Jesus. Now listen to what the Lord Jesus says. Then he said unto them in Luke 24, O fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Wow. Listen to this. Verse 44. And he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. And he called them fools for not understanding that. The scribes should have known that Psalm 8 was a messianic psalm. They should have known that babes and sucklings would be singing and praising the Messiah. They should have known that. But in the same way, they ignored all the messianic prophecies about the Lord's suffering, the Messiah coming to suffer. They just ignored all of those. They just ignored them. So they ignored the children singing to the Messiah. One way people overlook Scripture is to just ignore it. They just ignored everything that talked about the Messiah suffering. They just ignored it. Another way people overlook it is to say, well, that's spiritual. These babes and sucklings, that refers to us Pharisees, you know, because we are tender in heart and humble. In other words, you can get rid of Scripture by saying that's figurative. The woman shall not wear that which pertaineth unto a man. It's abomination. Oh, you wouldn't believe the things people come up with to try to get around these things. You know what they actually tell you? The people that interpret the Bible figuratively, they say, how childish and weak. You really, you're going to interpret the Bible literally? Don't you have any depth of understanding? You're interpreting the Bible like a little child. You need to grow up and understand these spiritual principles. That's what they say. They say literal interpretation is a childish principle. Hey, out of the mouth of babes and sucklings, thou hast ordained strength. They had more Bible and more Bible understanding than the Pharisees at that moment. Babes meant babes. Sucklings meant sucklings. You said, oh, wait a minute, preacher. Wait just a minute. I could see children shouting to the Lord Hosanna and praising the king. But you're telling me that a suckling? A suckling means somebody that's nursing. A child that's nursing. You're telling me that a nursing child can... Shout Hosanna to the Lord Jesus? I assure you that a child that's between two and three years old, especially if they are bright, can talk and often sing. She want to say Hosanna to the Lord? We got a little two-year-old, isn't she two, between two and three? You want to say, Hosanna? No? Okay. I didn't say they will all the time. I said they can. Maybe she'll do it a little later here. Um, 
Let me give you a Bible verse until she decides to come sing Hosanna to the king or B-I-B-L-E or whatever she sings. Listen, Lamentations. My eyes do fail with tears. My bowels are troubled. My liver is poured out upon the earth for the destruction of the daughter of my people because the children and the sucklings swoon in the streets of the city. They say to their mothers, where is corn and wine? There you go. So yeah, I believe there were sucklings. I believe there were little nursing kids that were almost about to turn three that were shouting Hosanna. And they were jumping up and down and probably dancing and just so excited about King Jesus. Oh, I believe that. I believe that's what happened. Jews often nursed until three years old. You can find that in uh, 2 Chronicles 31. Um, we have an example here of someone between two and three that can sing, can talk. You can go to the internet right now and find children singing. <laughs> that same age. So I, I believe this is proven. How much more so 2,000 years ago before the video age gave everybody brain damage because the parents had brain damage and they said if I had brain damage I want to make sure my children have brain damage. And, and the chemical age you understand where kids say I know you uh, the parents uh, with brain damage want to give their kids the Twinkies and all the chemicals and just make sure they end up just like them see with no other cognitive capacity whatsoever. It worked out so great for you, so let's go curse the next generation. No, I'm telling you, 2,000 years ago, I believe kids could think and sing and talk way better than they can today. We've got some amazing cases of it right now. There's so much more that can be said, but I just want to conclude with some more proof for you, all right? Matthew 2, when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. And they said unto him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet. Why don't some of these figurative interpreters, why, do, why don't they ask a question here? How did the scribes know the Lord Jesus would be born in Bethlehem? Because that's what the prophecy in Micah said. It said Bethlehem. Bethlehem meant what? It meant Bethlehem. Here's Micah. But thou, Bethlehem, Ephratah, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me, that is to be the ruler in Israel, whose going forth have been from of old, from everlasting. They knew that was the Messiah. He's going to be born in Bethlehem. How did they know he'd be born in Bethlehem? Because the prophecy said Bethlehem. Friend, when the prophecy says Israel, it means Israel. When it says Egypt, it means Egypt. We got some confused people teaching the Bible today. People say, well, isn't there a spiritual Israel? Isn't there a spiritual interpretation? Isn't there a devotional interpretation? Oh, yeah, but you better leave the literal alone. Leave the literal alone. You want to make John the Baptist spiritual Elijah, figurative Elijah? Go ahead. But you better leave Elijah alone. The Bible said Elijah's coming. Elijah's coming. That's what our Lord taught. This verse says Bethlehem. Messiah was born in Bethlehem, not spiritual Bethlehem. Not spiritual Bethlehem. What about the prophecy in Zechariah we already read where the king would come lowly with salvation riding upon an ass? Well, that's not going to be literal. He's not going to come riding upon an ass with a colt behind him. Are you out of your mind? The colt is a picture. It has four legs. It's a picture of the four-legged spiritual whatever, whatever. No, man. The donkey meant a donkey. The colt meant a colt. And he rode upon the donkey. 
The prophecy was literal. Even prophecies that you said, well, that one has to be spiritual. They're literal. They're interpreted by the Holy Ghost as literal. The Bible said in the last days, Laodicea will be naked. You say, whoo, spiritual nakedness. Oh, he means spiritual naked. You sure? You sure? What if it's both? I assure you it's both. The Lord's prophesying to you that the last state of the church will be a naked church in the mainstream. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise, when as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. That was a miracle. That's called a virgin birth. That doesn't happen. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. You go back and read in Isaiah, and it says, Isaiah 7, Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. And it goes on, and you find out that Isaiah has a wife. She conceived. And a lot of the prophecy is fulfilled in his day, but she wasn't a virgin. He said, well, she was just a woman, and it just meant woman. So all these liberals and higher critics come in and they say, this wasn't a virgin birth. Isaiah didn't mean that. It's a double prophecy, people. It meant virgin. If you say that can apply to a woman, it didn't hear. It meant virgin. The Holy Ghost took that to mean. You should have took that in the utmost literal sense that you could take it. The Messiah is going to be born. His name's going to be Emmanuel, which means God with us. This is going to be a supernatural birth. Talk about literal interpretation. Wow. Don't you mess around with prophecy. It says in Hosea, Thou called thy son out of Egypt. That must be talking about Israel as the firstborn son of the Lord, and he called him out of Egypt. Oh, but wait a minute. Wait a second. Are you sure? Matthew 2, when he arose, he took the young child. Joseph took the young child, Jesus, and his mother by night and departed into Egypt and was there until the death of Herod. So he came out that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet. That's Hosea saying, out of Egypt, I have called my son. So, well, that's spiritual son talking about the whole nation of Israel. No, the Lord said, no, it's my literal son. Son meant son, literal son. Woo! Literal interpretation? He said, so you believe I'd interpret the Bible literally? Beyond anything you, would have, you could ever guess. Beyond anything that you could ever guess or imagine. Yes, you should interpret the Bible literally. So how do you know Lord Jesus taught me? Holy Ghost taught me right here in the book. The Lord says, if you don't allow him to teach you, how will you understand anything? How will you understand anything if you don't let him teach you these basic things? Matthew 27, and they crucified him and parted his garments, casting lots, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet. They parted my garments among them, and upon my vesture did they cast lots. Here's the prophet. Psalms 22, they part my garments among them and cast lots upon my vesture. Through double prophecy, you should have understood. David's not just saying stuff in random. The Holy Ghost is inspiring him to prophesy of the future Messiah. He's not writing something just to write something. The Holy Ghost didn't put this in the Bible for thousands of years just to have it in the Bible. It's there as a prophecy of our Lord Jesus. It's not arbitrary. It's not David just showing you how poetic he is. 
This is a prophecy of the Messiah. They will part his garments and cast lots upon his vesture. Mark 15, and with him they crucified two thieves, the one on his right hand, the other on his left hand, and the scripture was fulfilled. That's in Isaiah, which says he was numbered with the transgressors. So that was fulfilled. Transgressor meant transgressor. Two thieves right there to him, to the left and the right. Two thieves. There it is, Isaiah 53. And he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. You wonder why those Jews and scribes and chief priests didn't say, what? wait a minute, how is the Messiah suffering? How is the Messiah numbered with the transgressors? I'm confused. It was an Ethiopian that said, you know what? I'm really confused about this scripture. And Philip ran over to him and explained it. This was Jesus. This was the Messiah. The Messiah had to suffer and then enter into his glory. The Ethiopian, in some ways, knew more Bible than the scribes did. Because the scribes would not ask the question. They could not ask the question. They were afraid to ask the question. See, when something proves you wrong or costs you in some way, you're not willing to know it. You can't look at the evidence. You've got to deceive yourself, see. Jesus says, I speak not of you all. I know whom I, whom I have chosen, but that the scripture may be fulfilled. He that eateth bread with me hath lifted up his heel against me. Jesus answered, he it is to whom I shall give a sop. That is bread dipped in olive oil and vinegar. When I have dipped it, and when he had dipped the sop, the bread, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. So Judas was the one that ate bread and lifted up his heel against me. He walked out to betray the Lord Jesus Christ. Psalms 41. Yea, my own familiar friend in whom I have trusted, which did eat of my bread, hath lifted up his heel against me. Say, David, who are you writing about? It didn't matter. You could go back and try to find out. Because we know one thing David was writing about was the Messiah. Is going to be betrayed by somebody that's going to eat. Well, bread's just spiritual. No, it was bread, buddy. He ate bread with the Lord Jesus and then went out to betray him. I'm telling you, interpret the Bible literally, folks. I could go on and on and on, but I'm not. I'm just giving you a few more. John 18. Then said Pilate unto them, Take ye him and judge him according to your law. In other words, go stone him. The Jews therefore said unto him, It is not lawful for us to put any man unto death, that the saying of Jesus might be fulfilled, which he spake, signifying what death he should die. In other words, the Romans put people to death not by stoning, but by crucifixion. And all along, Jesus said in John 12, And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. This he said, signifying what death he should die. Lifted up from the earth. Lifted up from the earth. Crucified. Crucified. It says back here, the scripture had to be fulfilled. What the Lord said had to be fulfilled. The scripture said the Lord would be pierced. He would be pierced, not stoned. He would be pierced. And the Lord said, I'm going to be lifted up from the earth. Literal, literal, always literal. Unless unbiblical or absurd. The problem is, you're going to think some things are absurd and they're not. You just don't have enough light. You don't have enough understanding of revelation. John 19, but when they came to Jesus and saw that he was dead already, they break not his legs, which was common to do to everybody they crucified, to speed up the death. But one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side, and forthwith came there out blood and water. 
the bones of the Lord Jesus were not broken. Wow. For these things were done that the scripture should be fulfilled. A bone of him shall not be broken, said the Old Testament. And again, another scripture, they shall look on him whom they have pierced. He was pierced in his side by the spear. He was pierced by the nails in his hands and feet. Pierced meant pierced. The Messiah had to die. But he had to die in such a way that they pierced him, but no bone was broken. Perfect, literal interpretation beyond anything anybody would have ever imagined. The psalm says, and many others, Psalms 34, He keepeth all his bones, not one of them is broken. You say, but how do we know that's double app? Because these are messianic psalms, people. They pierce my hands and my feet. The prophecy of the Messiah, the son of David, the son of David, the Messiah. Look at Zechariah 12. Amazing scripture. Look at this now. God says in Zechariah 12, I will pour upon the house of David. Who knows what the house of David's going to be when this happens? Who knows? Anybody got any idea? How about the house of David? How about the house of David? After everything we've seen, if it said house of David, I bet it means house of David. I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem wonder where that is. Mystery Jerusalem. Did it say Mystery Jerusalem? No. That's New York, right? No, that's some church in New York or some church in California, right? No, it's Jerusalem. It's Jerusalem. The spirit of grace and of supplication. Well, that's going to make a lot of people very angry. The Lord said he's going to have mercy upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem and the house of David. And they shall look upon me. Who's talking? God. God, not the prophet. God's talking. They shall look upon me whom they have pierced. Now, wait just a second. I'd like to talk to a rabbi right now and say, when did you pierce God? Well, that's a spiritual piercing. They shall look upon me whom they have pierced, and they shall mourn for him. That's going to be a bad day. Because Israel is going to need saving and rescuing. Nations are going to be coming against Israel. Israel in unbelief. As the Bible predicted thousands of years ago. And Christians for 2,000 years of all denominations have said Israel will be restored in the last days in unbelief. And this happened in 1947, 1948, friend. It was one thing for people to shake their head and scoff and say, that's never going to happen. And they did, they did, right up to the time they became a nation. Then they had to say, well, those aren't Jews. Ask the Muslims whether they're Jews or not. And one day, when all these nations are coming after them, the Lord's going to show up. They're going to say, yay, the Messiah's here, our deliverer. We knew it would happen. And they're going to look at him. They're going to say, you're the Messiah. They say, yep, I am. They say, why do you have holes in your hands? Why do you have holes in your hands? And the Bible says they're going to cry and weep and mourn and realize for all of these 2,000 years, 
they had rejected and Jesus really was the Jewish Messiah that was to come. And one shall say unto him, What are these wounds in thy hands? And he shall answer, Those with which I was wounded in the house of my friends. My friends did this to me. The Jews did it to me. Wounds in your hands. Folks, this is Scripture. This isn't New Testament. These are books they're digging up all over the place. This is Old Testament Scripture. Hundreds of years before the Lord came. Israel means Israel. Jerusalem means Jerusalem. Bethlehem means Bethlehem. Piercing meant piercing. These proofs and so many more show why for 300 years after Christ, all of the early Christian writers were literalists when it came to prophecy. They believed in the restoration of Israel. They believed in a temple. They believed in a literal new Jerusalem that was going to come out of the sky and land on the earth. They believed in a literal thousand-year kingdom that the Lord was going to set up, that they get to reign in if they will be overcomers. 300 years. You say, what changed? The Roman Empire began to give money to the people of God. No more persecution. <clears throat> give you beautiful buildings and cathedrals. To make a long story short, a bunch of Christian scholars began to say, we love the writers of the first 300 years. We love these early Christian fathers. But what babies they were when it came to understanding prophecy. They were just babes and sucklings when it came. They didn't understand all the spiritual things that we understand. They said, can you believe one writer on the book of Revelation actually said they're going to have so much fruit when the kingdom comes, the grapes are going to be this big, and it's going to be so amazing. They said, how sad that is. These poor souls, they were so blind. They actually believed in a literal thousand-year kingdom on this earth. They were so carnal. They were such materialists, and we're so spiritual now. Get welcome for pagan Catholicism and all of its asceticism and nunnery and monkery and all of that mess. That's how you ended up in that garbage. They thought the first 300 years of interpreters were just a bunch of babies. I like what the Lord said. If you want a spiritual interpretation, I'll give you one to go alongside the literal. Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings, thou hast perfected praise. I tell you. Last verse for you today. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, those that are wise in their own eyes. And God hath chosen the weak things of the world, the children, to confound the things which are mighty. Dear Father, we thank you, Lord, that you teach us how to interpret the Bible, Father, that you can keep us from error to the left or to the right, that you help us, Father. We thank you so much for these principles of understanding, these principles of interpretation, Lord, that you've given us, that you've... Uh, commanded us to know and you hold us responsible as if we ought to know them if we've studied the Bible and read the Old Testament even. Father, I do pray that you help us grow, help us never play games with your scripture, save us from the Looney Tune cults, God, and all of the false teachers that, that are so humble and pious and, uh, but oh, Father, so wrong in their nonsense, God, because they just don't want to take the plain, simple meaning of scripture we thank you so much lord that you revealed over and over and over and over and over again and we barely scratched the surface god of how many times you have taught us that uh, the literal sense is the true sense unless it's absurd or unbiblical and we can prove it god we better be careful about that now lord i do pray this people all of us and anyone listening We'll have a love for your scripture. We'll understand you're not playing games with them, Lord. 
You're not trying to trick them. You have a letter that you've written that's your will. And I pray, Father, we will not justify ourselves, but we will study it to show ourselves approved. We'll obey your commandments in love and diligence. In Jesus' name we pray. Thank you for the gospel. Thank you for your piercing. Thank you that you were pierced for us, that you gave your only begotten Son. Thank you that you died on this cross for us, that we might be saved through simple faith, Lord, accepting your gift. Thank you so much for that precious gift of salvation. In Jesus' name, amen, Church of God. Anybody have a...